we will start our question and answer session for the month of May. This month we have a lot of questions, so we start kind of early. Usually we start near at the end of the month, but this month we already had some 30 or so questions. 36 so 36 far. so far. So let's start with the first question. Okay. Question number one from Sama Nera Nyanat Sami. He's from Lebanon and he lives in Myanmar. Since life is beginningless, does it imply that our stock of karma is endless? And if so, what hope do we have to eradicate it completely? The goal is not to eradicate your karma. The goal is to uh, be outside of the influence of your karma. And the only place that you can be outside of the influence of your karma is Nibbana. So that's what you want to do. You want to develop your mind to reach Nibbana. Once your mind is in Nibbana, then your mind will not take birth anymore. Once you don't take birth, then karma has no influence on, on your mind any longer. So this is what you, you do, we do in Buddhism, is to develop the mind to the highest state, which is Nibbana, by purifying the mind, getting rid of the defilements and cravings and desires by the practice of sila, samadhi, and panya. Once we have sila, samadhi, and panya, then we can purify the mind. Once the, pure, once the mind becomes pure, it doesn't go and take birth anymore. So all the karma that we have done in the past will have no influence to this mind anymore. His next question, do you teach jhana? What is your method to achieve them? By developing mindfulness, concentrating your mind on one object, such as the mantra, Bhutto, 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 in all your postures, from the time you get up to the time you go to sleep. Try to stop your mind from thinking aimlessly by using Bhutto, Bhutto. If you can, if you like to use your body, then keep watching your body, focus on the action of your body. Regardless of what you do, just be with your body. If you are washing your face, just stay with that. If you are eating, just stay with your eating. Don't let your mind go think of something else. If you have this mindfulness, you can keep the mind fixed with your body or with the mantra. When you sit, then you can concentrate either on your breath or on your mantra. And if you concentrate on just your breath or your mantra, then your mind will enter into jhana, and into the fourth jhana. Once you get the fourth jhana, then you have the right samadhi. Yeah. Once you have the right samadhi, then you can use it to support your development of wisdom or vipassana by contemplating on the nature of all things, that they are impermanent, that they are not under your control. And if you want them to be permanent or under your control, then you will have dukkha, uh, suffering. His third question, I want to audit and practice with you, but I'm prone to heat strokes and cannot tolerate the heat on the lowland. So can I spend the cold season with you and then head to the monastery on the highland during the hot season? And can you also recommend some monastery on the highland? Well, normally if you ordain with a teacher, then you have to stay with him for at least the first five years. You cannot be living unsupervised. So to come here, we expect you to stay here for five years. If you can, then you have to go to some other place who, where they will let you move around. But here we stick to the five rule, five years rule. Once you are, when you are ordained, then you have to stay with your teacher for five years. Question number four, question from Elizabeth Weber from Norway. My experience is that breathing meditation works best in formal sitting, but I find it difficult to follow the breath when I'm active. I'm, I think using puto works best for all objects, and using metta is more suitable when I interact with people. So, while working on developing mindfulness, 
Is it okay to change the object according to the situation? Yes, you have to. You know, whichever uh, object of meditation suits the situation, use that particular object of, uh, of mindfulness. Yeah. Her next question, question number five from Norway. Is it possible to full to attain full liberation using the Brahma Vihara as the main practice? No, you have to see the Four Noble Truths. You have to see the three characteristics in all phenomena. Her next question from Norway. Could you say a few words about the Bhavanga state and how to avoid it? Well, Bhavanga means the state of uh, calm, which can be two types, Bhavanga with mindfulness and Bhavanga without mindfulness. Bhavanga without mindfulness is when you go to sleep, you fall asleep, you have no mindfulness. Bhavanga with mindfulness is when you enter into jhana, you have mindfulness, so your mind is still uh, alive, uh, not alive, but aware of the situation of the mind. But when without mindfulness, then you don't know the situation of the mind. So these are the two types of pawanga. Pawanga with mindfulness is when you enter into jhana. Pawanga without mindfulness is when you go to sleep. Okay. Next question, question number seven from United States. How to progress from Sotapanna to Sakadagami? Well, when you, after you have achieved sotapanna, your next problem will be your sexual desire. You still haven't got rid of your sexual desire by becoming a sotapanna. A sotapanna get rid of his fear of aging, sickness, and death, but he still has sexual desire. So he has to develop contemplation on asupa, on the un, uh, repulsive aspect of the body. Look at the body completely, not just what you see outside. You have to go inside of the body, see the other parts of the body, such as the bone, the skeleton, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the liver, uh, the spleen, the intestines, the brain, and all the fluid in the body. Yeah. You have to look at the body thoroughly, both inside and outside then you can get rid of your sexual desire. Next question, num question number eight from Louis Ramirez, Canada. Is it okay to put my attention on the nostril when focusing on my breathing? If you're sitting, then you can use your, your focus on your breathing by focusing on your nostril or at the tip of your nose or the area above your lips where the air will contact the body. And focus on that point only. Don't follow the, the air inside or outside because you want the mind to become still. So you have to fix it at one point. Question number nine from Singapore, from Chua Siu Ju. Can one attain Buddhahood if he or she does not practice full time? Buddhahood can only attain when there is no Buddhism in the world. Buddhahood means someone who has become enlightened by his own will and power, his own ability and his own wisdom. Like the Buddha, when he was look, searching for Nibbana, there was no Buddhism. So he has to find Nibbana by himself. So when he found Nibbana, he, he became known as the Buddha the self-enlightened one, the self-discovered of, of, of Nibbāna. But after that, once there is the teaching of Buddhism, then no one can claim that he is a Buddha, because he, he must have heard the teaching of the Buddha, and then use the teaching as the, as the guide to reach Nibbāna. So those who reach Nibbāna in Buddhism is called the Arahanta Savaka, are the noble disciples. Yeah. So, anybody can become a Buddha or an Arahanta, Savaka, or the, or the noble disciple, if he can uh, develop uh, Sila, Samadhi, and Panya, 
namely sila means morality, samadhi means concentration of mind, and panya means wisdom, seeing the truth of all phenomena as being impermanent, as subjected the mind to suffering, as uncontrollable. Hmm. So can they attain if they don't practice full time? I don't know. You just have to. Normally, if you don't practice, then your defilement will take over your mind. So you have to uh, control your mind completely from the time you get up to the time you go to sleep. So yes, you have to. Sp you have to practice all the time, uh, except only the time when you go to sleep. Her next question, question number ten, is vacuum or light? Considered as elements. Vacuum, space, I think, is called the space element. You know, the, the sixth element are the water element, the earth element, the fire element, the wind element, the, the consciousness element, and the space element. These are the six, six elements, six basic space, six basic elements, the building blocks of all phenomena and things come from these six elements. Question number 11 from Dr. Ravi Rana Tunge, Australia. When a doctor prescribes womb treatment to patients, does he break any precept like killing living beings? No. Uh, those organisms like germs are not considered living because they don't have consciousness. Uh. It's not like uh, worms or you know flies or ants; they have consciousness. You know. Question number twelve from Debbie Jonas, Canada: If I take uh, others out for dinner and pay for them, is it bad karma for me if they order alcohol? Should I tell them that I o I only pay for the food and non-alcoholic drinks only, or is it okay for me to pay everything? they happen to order, including alcohol. It depends on how strictly you want to adhere to the Buddha's teaching. If you do, then you don't want to support or uh, uh, encourage people to, to do things that is harmful to them, such as drinking alcohol. So you can tell them before t you invite them, they said, you will invite and pay for the food but you will not pay for the alcohol. So that way you, you won't be encouraging them to get drunk. Uh, so you can talk to them before you, you do it. But if you feel that it's not proper for you to do so, then just, okay, just only one, it's only one time, and leave it up to them. If they want to drink, let them drink. If they don't want to drink, it's up to them. But your purpose is to build good relationship with that person. Maybe then you you don't want to set up any conditions. But if you want to, and you, if you think the person can accept your condition, then you, you can tell them that. Her next question, question from Canada. I am a music teacher, and I would like to, I would like some advice in deciding whether to have extracurricular choir this year. Please let me know if this is the correct way of thinking. It depends on what I want to do. If I want to have really good choir, I have to put the time in. There's no other way around it. But if I want to have peace of mind, I have to let go of worldly success and be happy with working less and having lesser worldly result. Please straighten my thinking. Well, you have to decide which one is better for you. Yeah. Money and fame or peace of mind. Some people think money and fame is better than peace of mind, and some people think peace of mind is better than money and fame. So each one has to decide for themselves which is better for them, and then, then they choose that one for themselves. But according to the truth, nothing is better than peace of mind. The Buddha said peace of mind is the highest form of happiness there is. The rest, they are... They have, they have happiness of te temporary duration. They come and go. And they also have uh, sadness attached to them when they disappear. But with peace of mind, there will be no such sadness attached to peace of mind. 
Because once you know how to develop peace of mind, then you can always keep it, maintain it. Next question, question number 14 from Danilo Kamasa, Italy. What is the difference between Kama Loka, Rupa Loka and Arupa Loka as they are all mental realities? Now these are the three realms of existence. See, Kama Loka means the, the realm of existence of the, of the mind that still has uh, cravings for the senses as the object of, of, of pleasure. Those who still like to see, to hear, to feel, to touch, to, to smell, to, to taste, they will be born in the Gamma Loka, the realms of uh, sensual pleasure, such as the with, with, just, just such as animal and human. They have physical body, but there are also those who have no physical body who are still in this realm, such as the devas or the the lesser. Uh, being, spiritual being that has done not come, bad karma, then they, would, they will exist as hungry ghosts or some other form of beings which is not desirable form such as being in, in hell. This, are all, this is the composition of the loka, uh, karma loka, the sphere of sensual existence. Yeah. Then those who, ha those who can practice Meditation and attain the rupa jhana, the first, second, third, and fourth rupa jhana. Then they will be born in the rupa in the rupa realm, the realm of uh, of, of of calm, peace of mind, uh, without having to have a body to to make them happy. Yeah. And those who can practice and develop the rupa jhana. Then they will go into another higher realms of existence, which has more happiness than the rupa realm. So these are the three realms of existence that all minds uh, exist by virtue of their karma or their practice. If they still uh, have, if they still support their desire for the sensual gratification, then they will be stuck with the sensual spheres of existence. If they satisfy the mind by meditation and enter into the four rupa jhana, then they will be in the rupa existence, rupa spheres of existence. And if they can enter the arupa jhana, then they will enter into the arupa sphere of existence. His next question, is human kingdom the only physical realm? No, the animal also. The animal also has the physical part, the body. Animal and, and human are the same as far as the physical, the body is concerned. But the difference is the, the ability to, uh, to separate right from wrong. Human has the ability that hurting other people is wrong. Why animals don't have that ability? So any human being, even though if they are human being, but if they cannot separate f right from wrong, then they are uh, virtually animal, even though they have a human body. That's why sometimes we have to put these people in a cage, put them in a cell, put them in a jail, see, because they cannot separate right from wrong. So they behave like animals. His next question, can the subjective experience, like personal dreams, be shared with other chittas? No, each one belongs to that particular mind yeah. and is created by good or bad karma. If you have good dreams, it's created by your good karma. If you have bad dreams, it's created by your bad karma. His next question, question from Italy. In the Parinibbana state, are there still relationship with other citta that had reached that state? If you mean Parinibbana, I mean Nibbana without the body, the mind without the body, then the mind usually doesn't contact any other mind, except under some unusual circumstances, such as uh, Ajahn Man, in his practice he said that sometimes he had Buddhas who had already entered Parinibbana, still contact him and teach him Dhamma. But this is only on, maybe on some personal reason or personal relationship. 
Otherwise, those minds that has entered into Parinibbana will just remain peaceful and not in contact with any other mind. His next question, is it possible for those who have reached Parinibbana to re relate to those in samsaric state? That's what I just mentioned. If the person is, is capable of contacting other minds such as uh, Ajahn Man, he has the ability to contact other mind, those minds without the body. Then yes, if that if that mind that has entered Parinibbana might in the, in the past have some personal involvement, they might still can contact each other and help each other. But it's only on a personal basis, not on a general basis. Like when the when the the mind that is still has still has a body, then the mind can be. Uh, be in contact with anybody who wants to come and listen to Dharma talk. Mm. Next question, question number 19. Can we experience other planes of existence during dreams or during meditative absorption state? Yes, when you are in meditation, when you are in the jhana, you are already in a different realm from the sensual realm. You don't go to movies, you don't go to uh, shopping, you don't go to, on holidays like those people who are in the sensual realms. You go to meditation, re retreat, and enter into jhana. So yes, you can enter it while you're still alive. All these three realms of existence. Next question from Rose, Space Coast, Florida, United States. Question number 20. What part of our mind we are supposed to educate to teach the Dharma? Is it Sankara or Vijnana? Or is it inner stillness in us? No, you have to educate sanya, your perception, because you have wrong perception of things. You think as you see things as permanent, as good for you, and that you can control them. But in fact, they are impermanent, bad for you, and you cannot control them. So that's why you have to keep contemplating on the three characteristics of existence to re-educate your mind, to change your perception of things. Once you see everything as bad for you, then you stop your craving for them, your desire for them. Once you have no craving, then you become, you have entered into Nibbana. Question number 21 from Florida, United States. Is genuine avijja the bright radiant light that we see without eyes? No, this is the, the level of practice when you have entered beyond, when you have passed beyond the anagami level, then you will come to f experience the luminous, the luminous of avicca. The mind becomes very luminous at that stage. And the luminosity is caused by avicca. When you first get there, you might think it's Nibbana, and you might become uh, uh, deceived to think that you have reached Nibbana because of this lum luminosity. But if you are careful, if you keep watching, you'll find that this luminosity is still impermanent. It, it can vary, it can change, it can become brighter and become less brighter. And you become attached to this brightness, then you still have, you still have dukkha. So you have to know that you don't want to fall into the trap of being attached to this brightness. So you have to treat it like any other phenomena. They are uh, impermanent, they can harm you, you cannot control them. So all you have to do is just leave them alone. Then once you leave them alone, then they eventually will disappear. Her next question, question number 22, is genuine avicca a manifestation of our breath? No, no, avicca is the one that controls your action, your thoughts. You think because you are deluded, you think money is good for you, you think marriage is good for you. Yeah. This is a which are working. Yeah. And that's why you need Dhamma or wisdom to, to, to re-educate re your mind, to get rid of your ignorance. Question number 23 from Joyce Tan, Singapore. 
After sitting for a period of time, I felt numbness in my lower leg area. Should I persist and try to bear with the numbness or should I try to get up slowly and do walking meditation? If you want to advance, if you want to make your mind calmer, calmer then you have to continue on practicing by ignoring the, the numbness of the body and keep focusing on your meditation object, such as your breath or your mantra. If you can persist, then your mind will go deeper and become calmer. And then the numbness or the painfulness of the body will not bother your mind. Your mind becomes ubeka. That's why you want to get. So you, you shouldn't get up if you want to move forward. If you, if you get up or you sh sh change your position, then you are starting over again. So you'll never move forward. Once you get to this point, you, be, you get stuck. You give up and you go and start, restart your practice again. Her next question, question number 24. During the initial sitting, I have the habit of letting the breath run through my entire body as I felt it helps to unblock some stagnant chi or energy. I then begin to do the actual meditation. I thought after the body feels comfortable, then I can do a better meditation. Please share your thought. Well, your pre-meditation uh, rituals, you can do whatever you want. But when you meditate, you want to focus on one object. And you must not, uh, if you use your breath, you must not for force your breath. You're supposed to just watch your breath. And don't force your breath to deep in, to breathe in deep or you know, breathe long or anything like that. Just let it breathe naturally. Just be aware of the breath, whether it's breathing long or breathing short, whether it's breathing in or breathing out. Just watch. Don't manipulate, don't manage your breath because you want to stop the mind from doing things. Her next question, question number 25, on walking meditation, where should I place my hand? Should I focus my meditation on the breath or on the leg? Should, I, should the walking pace be normal or slow? It's up to you which is the best, best way for you. If you find watching your breath, you can do it, then you do it. If you're watching your, your, your feet, then watch your feet. Personally, I think the breath is difficult to watch when you're walking. It's easier to wash your feet. Just concentrate on your feet. Left, left foot, left, right foot. And just say left, right, left, right. And so in to prevent your mind from thinking about other things. You can walk slow, you can walk fast, depending on the situation. If you're drowsy, sleepy, or lazy, you might force yourself to walk faster to, to get your physical energy up. Yeah. But if you are restless and agitated, you might want to walk slower to calm your mind, to calm your body. So it depends on the situation of, on your body and your mind. And you have to try it for, to find which is best for you at that particular time. Where should I put my hand? Anywhere. Normally you put it in front of your stomach uh, you know, and put it together by uh, putting your right hand over your left hand. Her next question, question number 26. You mentioned that in breathing meditation, I have to watch the nostril where the breath is called, whether the breath is coarse, fine, long, and short. Is it okay if I just note that I'm breathing without defining whether it's long, short? Yes, coarse? you don't need to. Just, just be aware. Yeah, just be aware. You don't have to say uh, in, out, or coarse, or subtle. Just, just know. That's all. Her next question, question number 27 from Singapore. Some of my friends do not do dana. They are free drinkers. They want to do meditation to calm the mind. Ajahn mentioned that we should do dana and sila before doing pawana. What will be the difference in the quality of meditation for those who just meditate without doing dana and sila and those who do dana and sila? Those who don't do dana, they don't have time to meditate because they are spend time spending the money, going on vacation, going to parties, going shopping. So they won't have time to meditate. Those who do dana won't have the money to go shopping or to go on holiday. So they have more time to meditate, see. Because 
you need a lot of time to meditate to be successful. But you only meditate uh, casually, then you can do. If you only do once a day or maybe once a week, then dana or, or not dana has no effect on your practice. But if you want to be a full-time practitioner, then you want to get rid of all your money. Because when you have money in your pocket, your craving and your desire will come and disturb your mind. So your mind will not be able to concentrate on your practice. But once there's no money, then there's nothing to bother you, to, to, to pull you away from your practice. So that's the purpose of dana. This is usually for the f full-time uh, practitioner, like monks. They have to give up all the possession and then then they don't have to worry about money. They don't have to worry about going holidays, going to parties, and buying gifts for Christmas for this or that person, because they have no money. So no one could blame them if they don't buy any gifts to give anybody. See, so this is the purpose of dana to get rid of your your obligation, to get rid of your attachment, your engagement with using the money. When there's no money, then there, you don't have any activity concerning the money. So you have plenty of time to meditate. But if you're just a casual meditator, you only meditate once a week or once a day, then whether you give dana or not give dana, it doesn't matter, it doesn't change the equation so much. <coughs> <coughs> Next question, question number 28 from Singapore. How to advise a good friend when she complains about having no time to meditate because she has to work very hard? Well, first of all, he, you must, he must ask for your advice. If he doesn't ask, then there, there's no need to give him because it's, it's not your business to give him advice. Only when he seeks your advice, then you should give him because advice that not sought will not be appreciated. So it's better not to advise someone who doesn't want to be advised. Her next question, question number 29 from Singapore. For a family without harmony, is it because of their past life karma? What can they do about it? Can you repeat the question? For a family without harmony. For, for what? A family. Can you say the, the beginning again? Uh, for a family. For? A family. Family like father, mother, that don't have harmony in the, in the family. For a family without harmony, okay. Yes. Is it because of their past life karma? What can they do about it? Uh, it's, it's the lack of the four Brahma Viharas. When you live with people, you have to have the compassion, you have to have loving kindness, you have to have uh, mudita, which is uh, happy with being happy with other people's success and ubeka, how to become uh, uh, become uh, not 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 engaged when there's the situation requires that you don't engage so this is what you you lack if you have loving kindness you have compassion you have uh, what you call joy for other people's happiness, and you have equanimity, mean to be uh, disengaged when you find the situation doesn't do anything better, then you disengage temporarily, then you will keep the living in harmony. Yeah. Her next question, question number 30, after finish my sitting meditation, do I need to radiate loving kindness for myself, for my loved one, and those unfriendly ones? This radiation of loving kindness is a myth. You know, it's it's not real. You're not ra radiating anything to anybody. The purpose of uh, uh, reciting the 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 what you call the loving kindness sutta is to teach you how to be loving kindness so that when you meet people then you will know how to radiate. You're supposed to radiate loving kindness when you're meeting people. Like when you, you know someone has a birthday then you buy some gift for them. 
this is radiating loving kindness. Or when somebody did something wrong to you, you forgive them. Then this is radiating mindfulness. And if you are angry and you want to hurt someone, then you say, no, I shouldn't do it. This is radiating my loving kindness. You, you do it with people or animals. You don't sit alone by yourself and radiate. This is a lot of BS, you know. Okay. Uh, next question, question number 31. Oh, I think. Uh, can I just elaborate on how to do loving kindness meditation? Just I, just I, I just said that. You have to do with people or animals. Yeah. Or even uh, celestial being, spiritual being, if you're in contact with them. Like if they come, you don't chase them away when you see a ghost. You should welcome them. Say, come on, welcome to my world. What happened to you? You need some help? You know, This is real. <laughs> okay. Question number 32 from Singapore. After doing loving-kindness meditation, can I continue, oh, continue to transfer our marriage? Can I transfer merit on behalf of my mom? Well, this kind of merit hasn't yet been, uh, been fruitful yet. Your practice hasn't yet had created any real merit. All you did was just trying to create one, which is, which is important. You have to practice a lot before you can get the result. Once you have the result, then you can share this merit with those, with the, those who has no body those who live in the celestial world, in the spiritual world. So we normally don't share this kind of merit because usually we don't have them yet. It's easier to share merit by giving dana. Because once you give something, you already have merit from this giving dana. Then you can share it right away. Her next question, question number 33 from Singapore. I used to do donation for my family members without them knowing. Recently, I informed them about the donation so that they can rejoice on those merits. If we do donation on behalf of family members where they are not aware of it, can they benefit from this donation? No. See, donation, the benefits from donation has to come from the heart of each individual person. The person themse themselves has to, has to have their initiation, wants to give something away. And that thing that giving away belongs to them. If it belongs to someone else, then, then they are not getting any merit. And so it has to, first you have to have the initiation, the thought of, I want to give some money away. Then the, the money that you give away must belong to you. Then you get the merit. If I give my money away and tell my friend that I have done some merit for you, they don't get any merit. You know, because they don't feel anything. Yeah. Question number 34 from Sudiarto, Indonesia. Do I have to develop jhana first before developing vipassana? Yes, because if you don't, you will not be able to use vipassana to get rid of your cravings and your suffering, your dukkhas. His next question, question number 35. I meditate one to two hours a day with some struggle. How can I make meditation to become a hobby? You need to develop a lot of mindfulness first. If you have strong mindfulness, when you sit, you enjoy, because your mind will become calm very quickly and no resistance from your defilements. If you have uh, weak mindfulness, then your defilement will keep uh, resisting your control of the mind, and you'll find a struggle, and you won't enjoy it. So you have to first use uh, develop mindfulness as your hobby first. You have you can do this from the time you get up to the time you go to sleep. Try to concentrate on something to prevent the mind from thinking about other things. If you can do this when you meditate, then your mind will concentrate on the object of your meditation. Then your mind can become calm and and calm very quickly, and then you'll be happy and peaceful and enjoying the every moment of it. Uh, last question, Long Paul, from Amy Tan, Brisbane, Australia. Question number 36. <coughs> you advise that one should not move the body while meditation. I follow this instruction, but my body gradually slant very seriously, although I didn't fall down and I didn't feel any pain. Usually, when my body starts to slant to the left or to the right, I will slowly adjust my posture. 
So should I let my body continue to slant or should I adjust my body once I notice it starts to slant? Yeah, you just, just ignore the body. Leave it alone. If you leave it alone, then I think it won't bother you. It won't disturb your meditation. But if you keep, uh, keep going back to your body, move your body back and forth, then you're not meditating here. Yeah. You are managing your body and you will not succeed in your meditation. The reason why your body moves is because your mindfulness is not strong enough. If you have strong mindfulness, like when you're sitting and talking with people, you, your body don't, don't shift to the left or to the right. Yeah. But when you meditate, you let your mindfulness uh, slip away. So then your body will then start to lean left or right. So when you meditate, you should ignore the body. Yeah. And just keep meditating. Doesn't don't care what position the body is in, until you find it difficult and impossible to continue on. Then you might then have to restart again. But this is not good. It's not it's not good to restart. It's it's good to keep going until you can no longer go. If you can succeed, then it means you have to develop more mindfulness. Question from YouTube live from Tony Romeo. Hello, Ajahn. How are you? How are you, Tony, from Las Vegas? Haven't heard from you for a while. How's life in the Sin City? <laughs> I have a question. Can anyone become enlightened anywhere? And if so, what is the best way to attain enlightenment? Enlightenment can be anywhere because the, per the, the thing that becomes enlightened is the mind. It's not the, the, the location. And the thing that can make a mind become enlightened is wisdom, the ability to see the truth as it is. Yeah. Right now we're not seeing the truth. We, we are seeing the, 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 what we call our perception of truth, which is not the truth. So we have to get rid of this perception and then the mind will see the truth as it is. And then you can become enlightened. To do this you need to do a lot of meditation to clear your mind from the wrong perception. Once you have cleared the mind from the wrong perception, then you, then you see that everything is impermanent. Whatever arises will cease, you know, such as the body. Once the body is being born, it will have to die sooner or later. If you can see this, really see it, then you, can, then you will not be afraid of death. You will let the body be, you know, because you know there's nothing you can do about it. Okay? That's all the question for today. If you have any more questions, please do send them and we'll talk and answer those questions the next time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. May you all advance to enlightenment. <laughs>